I want to start off by thanking you all for being here. This is just amazing. And thank you to, to Daphne for inviting me to be part of such a phenomenal lineup of speakers. <sighs> Within an hour of waking up, I am playing three games that promise to help me become a more prolific worker, healthy citizen, productive homemaker. While I'm a surveillance scholar, I am happily participating in this gamification. The more information I divulge from my weight to my location to my very words, the more enjoyable these gamified tasks become. And so I have a roadmap for the argument I want to make in the next few minutes. First, to understand gamification, we need to understand how games become a frame for interpreting and interacting with others. In looking at surveillance, we often gloss over play and fundamentally misrecognize its role. And so I'm going to lay out how I define these terms. I'm going to show how play and games change as they move from the analog to the digital. And I'm going to bring in gamification and link it to the quantification of everyday life. Like play, quantification also changes when it moves from analog physical spaces to digital computer spaces. And then I'm going to draw from governmentality literatures to explicitly tie quantification to surveillance. I'm going to apply this theory to a couple of case studies to talk about when gamification falls apart. And this leads to my conclusion, arguing that without first knowing what games and play are, we can't accurately respond to and critique playful surveillance technologies that are leveraged by gamification. <coughs> so on to the first part. Surveillance studies commonly employs two key frames, that of crime control and that of privacy. And these frames structure how we perceive, talk about, and respond to surveillance. But when we look at everyday surveillance, other very different things emerge, like empowerment, seduction, desire. Play is a new frame for examining surveillance, but it's not yet well understood. Instead of just thinking of play as something we do for fun in our free time, we need to think of play as a much more serious social interaction. And I take my definition of games and play drawing from people like Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salen. A game is an activity defined by rules in which players try and reach some sort of goal. In comparison, play is free movement within a more rigid structure. And so play emerges both because of, but also in opposition to these more rigid structures of rules. Following Irving Goffman, games are exemplars of encounters. They are an exemplar of when we, here, in person, we bracket a social space like this parachute game. We have a single visual and cognitive focus of attention. We enter into this space and we negotiate the rules. We do this together. Because these rules are socially constructed and upheld, the encounter quickly breaks down if not everyone is playing the game. We call these people cheaters and spoil sports. For Goffman, the fun of the games rests in the sense of spontaneous involvement, the singular and exclusive focus on the game on behalf of the participants. We become immersed, engrossed in these games and the social interactions that the system's rules and goals evoke. This is pleasurable. Put more simply by Mark Twain and Tom Sawyer, work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do. And play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. Once freedom of choice is removed, any game falls to pieces. It's no longer play. And advanced apologies here for what's going to become an atrociously ugly diagram. It's only going to get worse. Play and games change as they move from analog to digital. Non-digital play is important to Goffman as a site of social order because its very existence and persistence depends on participants agreeing to play the game and in doing so constructing and upholding a shared sense of rules that govern the experience. Before digitization, something else happens. Standardization and homogenization. Written rules allow the game to reach a much wider audience, structuring experiences that are replicable, comparable, uh, regardless of whether the game is played with different players in different locations and at different times. 
Board games do this, so do professional sports. The creation of a homogenous experience, and coincidentally one that's so much easier to commodify, reduces the spontaneous negotiation of rules that's part of a more of informal gameplay. Moving along this continuum, what's important about digital games is that rules aren't only formalized, they are completely hidden from players by the black box of the game software. There is no rule book for Fruit Ninja. The beeps and the coins and things like this channel my behavior and I just figure it out as I go. And so this digitization allows games to be distributed to a massive potential audience. And the work, because the work is in, of interpreting and maintaining these rules, and thus the system of social order, is taken entirely out of us players' hands and is instead reliant on algorithms. <clears throat> Moving away from games and gamification just for a second, all measurements, like when we step up onto that scale or take our blood pressure and heart rate, feed into circuits of reproduction. They make performances visible and thus reproducible. This monitoring and quantification becomes a connective social tissue, and it's essential for the reproduction of everyday practice. It links our micro-level individual performances to macro-level organization, and it spans our past, our present, and our future. Data from this metering becomes institutionalized forms of memory. It's implicated in larger patterns of continuity and change, such as states using individual weight measurements to speak about rising obesity epidemics, and then, in response, creating policies to regulate the food industry. In short, quantification is an essential tool in governance the conduct of conduct. When we subject ourselves to this quantification, we come to know and master the self. In the Foucauldian understanding of the care of the self, there's a pleasure associated with mastering and controlling the body, and even at times denying it. And at this juncture, I'm gonna start bringing gamification and this care of the self together. Gamification has always existed if we're thinking about giving stars for chores uh, and loyalty cards and things like this, but what's important about digitized gamification is how good it is at getting us to quantify ourselves, enrolling automatic data collection and feedback practices into an intimate care of the self. What's different here from the traditional care of the self is the precision, complexity, and the amount of data collected, as well as the way that it's presented back to us, the chronicler. This journaling process is now automated. And so it's relatively simple for us to measure and analyze patterns in our sleep, exercise, sex life, food intake, mood, location, alertness, productivity, our mental health, and our spiritual well-being. We effortlessly track and measure, chart and quantify, display and share all of this heretofore unknown, unquantifiable data at an unprecedented level of granularity. Digitalized gamification leverages the feedback tools from games as part and parcel of this care of the self. But the game to be played is about bodies and human capacities. With gamification, the interiority of the self is made recognizable, and more importantly, it's made actionable by the algorithms that frame the body and our behavior as something that we can measure, we can quantify, we can act upon. And so what gamification primarily leverages from games is the ways that games render space visible, from point systems to pathfinding. As this Rift dashboards show, games are really good at providing precise yet super complex feedback to help us players chart our current progress and determine what to do next. Porting the feedback methods used in games to non-game activities thus makes a lot of sense. We turn to gamification to respond to a gap in our everyday lives, where feedback on our progress, cues for future directions, and a place for experimentation and even failure is lacking. For example, this is the reality of my academic work, my tenure process, my book writing. I have no feedback, and thus I waste my time on games to actually feel like I'm progressing. 
We players interpolate ourselves in this data, seeing the messiness of everyday lives and the interiority of ourselves as something that can be finally, meaningfully collected into a database to be rendered understandable and actionable. And so take, for example, running apps. I hate exercising, yet these tools make the process endurable by turning it into a game about my favorite topic, a game about myself. And so Nike collects data about me, or at least the running me. And this data appears as a table, a database somewhere on their servers with variables that change over time depending on my input, such as how fast, how far, and where I ran. And so these algorithms of the software act on the table doing relational work. It makes value judgments and instantly feeds the info back to me in some form of juicy oral or visual feedback. And so I adjust my input and pick up my pace accordingly. And this process exemplifies what the digital does to play. The lovely sound of simulated coins clinking or bars leveling up, or an encouraging yet artificial voice provides the feedback and the support I crave. It brings me into this relationship with myself and the machine, and it persuades me to stay. These sounds and colors and badges let me know that the system is listening to me, that it is reading me, that its sensors are working. And this feedback feels so good. It works to mask the pain of my wheezing lungs and my staggering feet. Moreover, Nike broadcasts this data to sites like Facebook and profile pages, allowing me to share this detailed info with friends and play with them. Because my pleasure is not only rooted in my individual successes and beating the data from my shadow selves, but also rooted in my shared identity as a healthy subject, part of a community that embraces similar values. This is a form of being alone together. The mastery of my body creates some pleasure, but other pleasures are evoked by using data collection to create a shared social encounter in the Goffmanian sense, a mutually constructed, voluntarily entered shared social space. These gamified self-improvement apps evoke a specific agency, that of an active subject choosing to expose and disclose their otherwise secret selves, selves that can only be made penetrable via the data streams and algorithms which pin down and make this otherwise unreachable interiority amenable to finally being operated on and consciously manipulated by the user and shared with others. The fact that these tools are also consumer monitoring devices run by evil corporations that create neoliberal responsibilized subjectivities, it becomes less salient to the user because this freedom to quit at any time. In contrast, the case of gamified workplaces exemplifies an entirely different problematic. In theory, it shows that not everything can be made into a game. Something happens with gamified workspaces that's different because they not only rely on self-surveillance or lateral participatory surveillance, but hierarchical, disciplinary surveillance. Stanford professors Reeves and Reed apply game elements from the Puzzle Pirates games to the hypothesized design of call center work. In their idealized workplace, employees log into the game each morning and select a team to work with. Assuming the roles of pirates, they take a ship and go plimp plunder and pillage and quest for treasure. And so this interface encourages them to click on avatars to automatically check on their teammates' progress. And instead of advocating a single most efficient method of production for every task, the competitive game instead provides incentive to continually improve efficiency, to innovate, to find creative methods to field the greatest number of calls in the shorter amount of time. And so broadcasting to one's coworkers and supervisors to the second how long one spends on calls or how many calls one has fielded isn't Orwellian anymore. It's a way to earn victory points, complete quests, level up. And with a minute-by-minute -minute monitoring, gamifying the workplace results in a game that's never turned off. And this is the problem. If workers can't turn the game off and they're unable to choose whether to participate, then it's not a game anymore. The practical failure of gamified workplace lies in clashing frames and expectations of work and play. Playful frames may smooth over potentially contentious data gathering practices, such as sending Nike mothership a running record of my geopositional data, 
but it's unable to efface the reality of work, the hierarchical and unbalanced power relations that characterize these spaces, the social expectations therein, and the fact that covert surveillance is used to judge, rank, and punish employees. There's a tension between the game logic and the logic of the larger social context. When we have no choice but to participate, then we can't frame this as a game or play. It's work, what a body is obliged to do. It's a ploy, a thinly veiled ploy to create ideal workers. And so if we return to Goffman's concept of games as encounters, our shared social space, our entire game falls apart like a house of cards when we can include people who refuse to participate. And so this leads to two conclusions. There are limits to gamification in terms of framing. The moment that you understand that you're working, you're not playing. From our work, for our work to be experienced as play, everybody needs to be a willing participant. Understanding games and play are essential tools in outlining why these gamification projects fail, and not just jumping on the overhyped gamification bandwagon, nor dismissing it altogether. The gamified quantification of the self ostensibly allows us to replace the holes in our memories and the vagaries of our intuition with something much more reliable and seemingly more objective, streams of numbers. But if we're going to unpack digital play, we need to also unpack its algorithms. And this is the danger of digitized processes, especially games. We cannot open the black box of the software that hides the rules from us. We cannot see why some of our actions are deemed successful and rewarded versus others that aren't. And so there's no space in these existing systems for the mutual renegotiation and agreement upon the rules. And so this is where I'm going to end you, thinking of future research directions for understanding the intersections of surveillance, games, and play. Thank you so much for listening.